How to Build People and Planet Positive Homes. Hi, my name is Marcin Wojciech Żebrowski and welcome to the newest episode of Herbcast, my podcast about urbanism, architecture, cities and many more. Welcome to the newest episode in which we will focus on the nature and also people and the planet in the way how we design and build our homes and, and our cities as well. Today I will be talking to Kasper Guldager Jensen, who is one of the co-founders of Home.Earth, a real estate company which is actually focused on designing, developing and building properties with an ambition of owning and operating them forever. So they are focusing on truly affordable and sustainable homes combined with active ground floors to create vibrant and diverse neighborhood. What is important to mention is that they are operating basing on the so-called triple bottom line, which is creating impact across people, planet and profit. My today's guest, Casper, is the founder of GXN Innovation, which is a leading research company on innovation and climate transition in the built environment. Casper created it actually more than 10 years ago as a part of FreeXN Architect that he used to be an uh, ex-senior partner of. During this conversation, we're gonna focus on the nature as a main driver for the design, how to approach and how to change our way of thinking and designing towards the circular design, what is important about cradle to cradle approach and how is Casper using many, many years of his experience and knowledge from designing with nature into the new development, which is the home.earth. Since the home.earth is pretty new establishment, they are less than two years old. So I'm asking about the idea for the real estate uh, development company, which is actually putting the planet and the people actually on the bottom line next to the to the profit. Since of course, the, this company has to make a profit somehow, but as Casper will try to explain in our conversation, it is possible to do it in a sustainable way, to develop homes in a way that we are taking care of the planet at the same point while we are providing the housing, which is of course extremely, extremely needed nowadays, especially in the cities which are rapidly growing. Nature, profit, planet, people, these are the main uh, points of our discussion that I would love to invite you to listen to right now. Welcome to our conversation with Casper. Casper, thank you. Thank you so much for hosting me, for being part of the of the show. Yes, welcome. We will talk about uh, some important things today about homes, about how to build homes in a sustainable way. But maybe we will first dive into some basics, some background for this discussion. Because when I was preparing myself for this talk, one of the key messages that I remembered after after watching your um, your presentations is that we shifted from, or we are shifting actually now from the linear building process towards the circular way of doing things. But I know that you've said that already a couple of years ago. So do you think that nowadays in 2022, this is still like that? Are you on the journey or we are already there? Well, um, we are not already there. I mean, we are maybe uh, trying to, to predict the future and do things in a new way that is uh, maybe more inspired by nature. So going from a linear to a circular mindset is um, also what you can say is um, inspired by nature's ecosystems where everything has a purpose for something else. And in nature, waste does not exist. So can we actually live in a way so we eliminate waste? So that's very much on the kind of the circular agenda. I think what we're doing now and also what I'm expanding my, my work with is also the whole social dimension. So we are both really trying to create a world uh, with uh, environmental circular thinking, mm. uh, but also um, social circular thinking. So, so it's this duality between like doing good for the environment and doing good for people uh, at the same time. You've mentioned the nature and I think that we can't not 
mention the nature here in, in this hour discussion. In one of the of the other videos for TEDx, yeah. you've mentioned that nature has the strongest materials. Uh, the, the spider silk, for example, is, yeah. is, is even stronger than steel. I was wondering because this TED discussion was recorded more than 10 years ago, actually. Time flies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and here I wanted to say, and I wanted to ask again, what changed? Did we learn to use the nature resources a bit more? I think uh, inspiration from nature is uh, is kind of an endless amount of solutions out there. Uh, mm. So it, it is inspiring to see how nature is uh, innovative and creative and uh, and where many of our answers, uh, questions, the answers uh, you can find in nature. I think the biggest inspiration, is, as I said before, like this ecosystem thinking, how can we be inspired by nature's way of organizing itself. I mean, the materials you are mentioning, like spider silk, uh, uh, things that are stronger than uh, what we use in, in construction uh, are made uh, without excess energy. So it's like uh, room temperatures. It's, you can have materials that are air purifying, that is energy harvesting. So I think a lot of this we can mimic, like it's called biomimicry. So you actually mimic what is uh, in nature. So can we do architecture and cities that are purifying the air, that is harvesting energy, that is regenerative, that exists without waste. So these these are the, the things to get inspired by in nature. So it's it's still an inspiration. And metaphorically, it's, it's, it's this ecosystem thinking. Can we make a man-made ecosystem, not just a, a natural ecosystem? Because we do live in cities, we do organize us apart from nature. So, but can we can we do some of the same logics and so it's just that kind of systemic thinking, I think, is is super inspiring to to draw parallels to. Do you think it's time, the highest time to come back to the nature? Because you can hear about different pandemics. And I don't mean the, the pandemic that changed our world two years ago, but for example, the one of the mental health. More and more people are having problems with different things. And, and the mental health is, I think, people start to talk more and more about that. So if we talk about that, in this umbrella of uh, social sustainability, would you see nature as an answer to, to those as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, um, as a species, we, we are not, we didn't move into buildings until like a few centuries ago. And uh, so, so I think we are kind of uh, engineered for, for something, uh, you can say like uh, for, for nature settings. So I think all the, the qualities of, of being in nature, I think you get disconnected in cities from, from nature and in many levels, I mean, just uh, the bare connection to, to nature, how do we integrate green in uh, the cities and also with daylight and uh, fresh air and the whole health aspect. But you also touch upon the, the social, like the loneliness or the, we have some social structures that, that we need to deal with as well. So you can't just be um, talking about the kind of the fundamentals in terms of air and light, and heat and kind of the comfort adjustments, but but it's really also like the social fabric. Uh, we need to design for that as well. I don't know if, if, if that is in nature, but I know people are kind of a, a flock, a species. So we need to interact and we need to design for that. So I really think some of the new agendas is to design for uh, for the common, like what can we share, both in terms of environmental thinking, but also social thinking. Can we design structures where you actually get to know your neighbor, where you take some responsibility and where you, you meet and share and exchange and inspire each other. Uh, so I think it's really interesting when you can couple the environmental thinking with the, with social quality. You said that we are getting detached from, uh, from nature in our cities. I don't know if this is possible to be reversed in a way that we are getting more nature in the city, but maybe we can talk about it in a minute. I'm also curious about your own background because there are luckily people like you who are advocating for for the Silk Road way and also for building in a way that we are uh, showing the, the respect to the nature. What was your situation that influenced your way of thinking and your interest in nature, where you may be raised in a, in a yeah. na among nature yourself, or maybe there was a moment that you realized that it's so, so important. I think one of the, the things, I mean, in a young age, uh, as a student, I did plan a, a huge conference of co-students from all over Europe that was called uh, Sustainable Living, where we did build ourselves in ecological materials and on the countryside uh, suggesting um, 
like eco communities and in early days uh, i think i was inspired by looking at some of the you can say like hippie communities uh, in, in outside the bigger cities in in, in denmark But I think also I've always taken an industrial approach to that. So what we did back then was then to say, how can we build with these materials, but how can we design it and how can we use solutions that are industrial, that you can scale up, that you can multiply. So I think it's it's about getting scale and impact has been my approach. But also then at some point I met this American architect and German chemistrist, Michael Braungart and uh, William McDonough that uh, are the authors behind a book called Cradle to Cradle. And that was an eye-opener to me because the subtitle of the book is Remaking the Way We Make Things. And and how can we think differently about the role as a designer and a city planner? So can we, from the start, think about these endless cycles and the ecosystem thinking? So so that really formed my my way to look at sustainability from being um, be inspired to being, uh, you can say, more fundamentally questioning the way we do things. Can we make a society where we think about how positive can we design it instead of doing less harm? It used to be like, how much can we lower our climate negative impact and and how can we save on heating or how can we reduce? So it's like a reduction game. And if you think it upside down, like how can I do a city that makes people engaged, makes people meet each other, that uh, inspire you, or also on the, you can say, technical part, like how can we generate energy, how can we purify the air, and how can we grow food? Or So it's this kind of positive agenda that really inspired me, and um, I think that there's a milestone in my career. I think that's, that's also like 10, 10, 12 years ago since I met them. Definitely Cradle to Cradle is an influential book. I have it on my shelf as well, thanks to my friend. And this is something that I think we can both recommend. There is also a part for the book recommendation at the end of this episode, but for sure that might be one of those. And I'm glad that you've also mentioned the design because often we are thinking about all different aspects, challenges and solutions, but in a theoretical way. And of course, we are a part of the design industry. And that's why my next question, my thought was directly attached to that because you've been the backbone for for the Green Solution House, for the so-called GXN, a part of the Free XN, some time ago already. And all this inspiration that you've just mentioned, was that your workplace, the workshop in which you could kind of express that and test and train and, and apply to the design? Yeah, you could say like uh, in popular speaking, I mean, I spent 15 years on developing tools and solutions for how to apply sustainable thinking to practice. Mm. And now as a developer in home.earth, I can uh, use, put all these tools uh, and solutions to use. But yes, I did uh, I did uh, found the green think tank within 3XN Architects called GXN. And uh, in, in those years, I spent a lot of time on challenging sustainability. How can it be practical? Like, what does it mean? How does it look? What does it cost? What is the value it creates? And how do you apply it? Because you have a lot of good ideals and things you want to, to do as a designer, but, but you need to be able to take it into to the shape of a building or into the fabric of a city. And you mentioned Green Solution House, which was a dream client uh, I had. So um, she runs a hotel and a conference and she wanted to make sustainability the attraction of her hotel and her conference. So Green Solution House is, is uh, I think, 75 green solutions that come together in a, a hotel and conference center where I think you can, uh, if you are into food, uh, then if you get a Michelin star, it, it means that it's worth traveling to this restaurant. And I think this was a a Michelin star for, uh, for for architecture. So if you're into sustainability, you want to travel there to to have your uh, hotel stay and also to do your kind of a green conferences. Um, so it was also like an important project to actually then showcase how can we purify the water of the building by using active algae. So how can we how can we take all the organic waste and and make energy with it and uh, and showcase uh, all these uh, green solutions in, in practice? Algae is particularly interesting topic, so I would love you to develop that a bit. But 
one more point to that. I remember you saying that if it comes to the sustainability, innovation applied to the design mm -hmm. uh, in your lab, in your work, you've been able to predict the design solutions for about two years into the future. We are not speaking about 200 years. Yeah. So how did it influence your work, your projects, even though it was one can say only two years in the future, right? Yeah, we worked not with, uh, you can say, core science, we worked with applied science. So so when are things uh, mature enough so you can take it from one context uh, into building context? So I think that's always been fascinating to me that, that it's not, not dreaming of a far future, but more like uh, how do we create the near future with the visions of creating a sustainable world? Because I think the power of the built environment really is to build a building, it's a statement, and that can inspire others. So, so I think that was what we tried to do, to demonstrate uh, new solutions and new techniques, new economies. Uh, I think that's another important part, that uh, I went from being very inspired by nature to also be very inspired by business models. So what, what is the value you create with sustainability? Because if you start to focus on the value and you can argue for that, then it's also a good investment. And then maybe you also need to redefine revenue, like what is the payback? Can the building you know, like extend your life? That's a really big value. It's also really hard argumentation to, uh, to provide, but maybe break it into sub-arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, but always try to like be uh, able to both argue, but also document the effect of uh, and the value of sustainability. So again, I think that we are coming back now here to this uh, practical use of the knowledge, applied knowledge, yeah. uh, so to say, as you mentioned. And I think that here is also a, a good moment to, to introduce uh, Home Earth, which is a, a real estate company that design, develop and build properties with the ambition of owning and operating them forever. But it's not a typical model. Could you develop that to the listeners? Yes. No, I mean, uh, home.earth is... Um purpose-driven. So um, our purpose is to do homes that are people and planet positive and also to introduce a new, you can say like a, a new agent in the, in the world of real estate. So we want to be a, a developer that takes a responsibility, of course, providing returns for our investors, but with a triple bottom line. So they get financial returns if you invest in us, you get a financial return, but also an ecological and a social return. And we see that money being financed uh, into uh, real estate has more and more obligations. And there are many uh, of us that ask for more meaning in your pension funds, for example. So if we can provide those kind of, you can say like returns, there's a lot of investment coming our way. So we are placing ourselves in a new spot where we have, uh, you say, both the environmental side, how can we rethink construction so we eliminate waste, so we measure everything towards uh, the planetary boundaries, which is a whole new kind of uh, measurement uh, account. Can we actually do buildings that are within the planet's uh, boundaries? And can we also do uh, societies where the, the social bottom line is eliminating uh, loneliness, but also creating affordable homes uh, for the many. And I think that's super meaningful to, uh, to try and have that agenda introduced. Mm. The three pillars of your work is the, the affordable homes, the, the, the livable communities and the balanced planet. But these seem to me very ambitious pillars, very ambitious goals. Yeah. How to, do you have an, any idea or, or maybe you are in process of defining how could you implement all of those within a, a one project? Well, I mean, it is very ambitious and, and also it's a journey. So uh, we start by defining the goals and then walking towards them. So um, for the balanced planet, we use these uh, planetary boundaries, uh, which is a, a new kind of way to uh, put scientific targets to what the Earth can regenerate. So we actually can, can talk about absolute sustainability. Is uh, what we do with uh, the embodied carbon of a building, is it uh, within the planetary boundaries or is it not? And it's also what you see happening in, uh, in, at least in Denmark, in Finland, in the Netherlands, in, in, in countries are, are getting more and more kind of um, aware of uh, the CO2 uh, embodied energy and operational energy of, uh, of what we do. 
and you can kind of reverse engineer that into what impact is a building towards the climate. So that leads us to uh, question all materials in use to go with uh, the lowest carbon footprint, but also to challenge the size that we actually can can have of our living areas uh, and our shared areas. So we actually want to to make uh, super efficient apartments and, and large uh, common areas, introducing the sharing economy. Then um, there are many other aspects of this. Uh, nature is a super important one. So we also work with being biopositive. So we actually are making more kind of green footprints than, uh, than we take over. So we also have some, uh, some biologists and, uh, and ways to document for that. So balanced planet is a big task and, uh, and also uh, an ambitious journey. Mm. Uh, but I think we are now with our first project, realizing some of the most ambitious uh, projects in, in, um, in Denmark. You are bringing the experience, the view from many different people from over mm-hmm. 15, if I remember correctly, yeah. different initiatives, companies, and so on. Did you just collectively meet and realize that there is this niche and need in the market? What was like your main assumption that the home.earth is actually a viable idea that might be possible to, to be developed into something that also earns money, right, as, yeah. a, as a company? Yeah, you're right. I mean, we are uh, 15 uh, co-founders, so it's it's an enormous group of co-founders, but we are all motivated to try and uh, do something differently with Home.Earth for real estate. I think the main founder of the company is uh, Rasmus Nørgaard, who um, who is uh, the classical real estate person behind Home.Earth. But he's not like classical in, in the sense that you would think, because he wants to show a new way for real estate with Home.Earth. In order to do that, he set this super interesting team of, uh, of co-founders. So I think his experience is to have founded um, the largest uh, real estate company in, in the Nordics uh, called NREP. And NREP is, uh, has grown to a success, but also on a mandate that is different from Home.Earth. So our mandate is differently, and that's why we need to start over to show this this way. So. In that way, we are kind of supporting uh, the initial thoughts of Rasmus to have another mandate that is with the triple bottom line. And that has this goal, as you say, to deliver a balanced, balanced planet, but very much on the social agenda, how to, um, to create, you can say, like sustainability as a, a choice to, to the many. I've been working with sustainability where I've done many projects in my past practice, but actually for quite a few a few people. So I think uh, doing homes for, for Earth and for the many is super meaningful. You've mentioned this uh, project that is the first baby, so to say, of home.earth, and you are starting the, the construction on the first site in, the, in 2023. It's uh, next year. It's uh, pretty quick, I need to say, since you've, you've started. It was uh, last year. And now you are creating the first project, which will be also residential and commercial space. So what is your main vision and, and your main assumption behind this? Because one thing is, as you said, you, you have some, some set of values and, and, the, and the bottom line design pillars, parameters. But the second thing is to apply those to a physical building structure. Mm. So what is your approach to that. Yeah, no, it's it's right. I mean, we um, we actually have two projects that we call uh, our kind of a sandbox projects where we test out and, and showcase all this. Uh, one is an existing building that we did uh, take over startup this year. And the other one is the one that we are getting uh, developed and built uh, next year. So uh, so currently the design is, is there and, and, uh, and, and we have uh, worked a lot on it. So what is interesting to take these visions to uh, reality is that well, we are going to uh, build with a like very low climate footprint. So all the choices we've made has been uh, weighed in from the beginning uh, in terms of, of climate impact. So it's going to be very bio-based. Uh, we built in wood. Uh, we have 70% lower uh, CO2 footprint than uh, the regulation requires. But also the, the fabric, like the way we mix apartments and mix social spaces and mix commercial areas, is, is to create life, but also to mirror society. Uh, 
So we've made a wide range of different uh, ways you can live in uh, in the project. Uh, so so it's it's really catering for for young, for you know, like big families, for uh, elderly, for really like trying to to create something that reflects society mm. and not just creating uh, you know like uh, uniform solutions. And it's also important for us. This is in an area where there's 8,000 inhabitants and there are no commercial spaces because it actually does not give such great a return, you can say, uh, as a developer to do commercial spaces. But we want to do that because it gives a great social return and it creates life during the day. So we are doing a lot of catering for life and for diversity and also for affordability. So all come together in, a, in an environmental project uh, with uh, lots of nature and biodiversity, but really, I guess it's a social fabric that, that is the nerve of, uh, of what we do. So do I understand correctly that you are advocating for the thing that there is more than only money investment return? So you said, uh, you, you mentioned that the, the social one and you mentioned also the way how you approach the nature. Mm. Are we at the point or are we going to the point in which we will put the money almost equally to the social aspect or the nature aspect, because you might probably read more and more about the end of the capitalism, right? So maybe yeah. it's time for the shift to different values that we put okay, like in, in the forefront. Yeah, I mean, we don't deviate from our purpose, you can say. Uh, so we have targets that we are pushing for, social targets, environmental targets, and financial targets. So... I don't know if it's the end of capitalism, because I also think in, in this kind of, um, we are a commercial company, but we have organized ourselves. So we have uh, mission locked what we do. So we uh, have a foundation that protects our purpose. So we won't compromise with our, you know, like uh, ambition on, on creating biodiversity, positive buildings affordable buildings, environmental buildings. So in that way, I think it's it's interesting to uh, make Home.Earth a scalable commercial company and at the same time to safeguard the purpose. Uh, so we have a we have a kind of an ethical board that uh, protects the integrity of what we do. So it's not the end of capitalism, but it's a new model on how to create a scalable purpose-driven business. Of course, I'm, I'm aware that uh, housing, uh, a flat, a place to stay is basically the basic commodity, the basic need that people have and probably people will need housing forever until we yeah. just come up with some <laughs> with some better solutions to yeah. that or at least more sustainable. But as you say, uh, I can see that we are trying to to be there, to be on this more sustainable path towards, towards building. But there is that one number that stacks in my head, and this is this 90% of time that we spend indoors. So do you think that it is possible to lower that number with the design so that we are spending less time? Or should it be the opposite? Should we assume that it's not possible to lower that time and just make us cozy and nice interiors and homes so that people can stay there? Well, I think the 90% indoor, it's a fact of how we are at least choosing to live our lives now. I don't know if that's horrible or not horrible. It depends mm. on how it is indoor. And I think that's the responsibility mm. that we can take. I mean, we, we need to make, you know, like homes healthy. We need to, um, we need to make homes socially engaging. And we need to make homes you know, with, with an environmental uh, responsibility. So the homes we do, we have a, a huge responsibility for. We do want to prioritize nature and we do make a lot of, uh, you can say like uh, social affordances, like offerings of, of inviting people outdoor. But we are a real estate company that are motivated by, you know, like the lack of um, choices you have in the larger cities in Europe. In Copenhagen, I mean, it's very hard to get a home if uh, if Agree. if you're not very uh, wealthy. So so we, we want to have a model where we can uh, give people the ability to get a home, but also a home with a responsibility. So the ninety percent, I mean, um, I think it's it's like a personal choice. I would like to spend more time outdoor, but I mean, for the indoor we provide, we need to have uh, the mm. responsibility with us. Even though you are quite 
young company organization and, and a team, you are already having uh, some projects and the one that is being constructed next year. So one might say that there is already some success, right? Some element that, yeah. that you might be proud of. But what is like this long-term uh, assumption, long-term vision that you are looking towards and that you are trying to, to reach? One or two examples could be that, I mean, I really want us to have impact within our own, uh, you can say like uh, success would be to grow a society of um, home.earth across many cities in Europe. So we actually can have a home.earth way of living uh, in Amsterdam, in Copenhagen, in Helsinki, in Hamburg, in Warsaw, and show a model. And I think that's that's the next, to show a model that can inspire other. And I see that already that the targets we set is are so challenging that they inspire others to also uh, be ambitious. So I think we can co-develop a, a new kind of level of ambition for real estate. Hopefully the impact will be much bigger than what we can uh, provide ourselves, but uh, to have this ripple effect so so other in the industry can can mm. start to think about planet positive buildings and, and people positive buildings. So let's hope that this innovation uh, spreads from this architecture and design branch to the other uh, sectors as well. Um, Kasper, I promise that uh, I will ask you for a book recommendation. Yeah. You've mentioned Cradle to Cradle already. So would that be a recommendation or maybe you have uh, something more? I think maybe that's a recommendation uh, that's kind of 10 years old on my end, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's everlasting. It could be curious to hear if people read it if for the first time today, if, if it's outdated or if it's as revolutionary as, as it was to me. But maybe then they go with a kind of a, a Netflix recommendation. There's a, just came out the, the Breaking Boundaries, which is a, a documentary on the planetary boundaries. Mm. What are the, the systems that, that Earth consists of that we need to maintain and respect to not have these kind of ecosystem collapses? So breaking boundaries, not breaking bad, but breaking boundaries <laughs> on Netflix is, is also a really good recommendation. Thank you. I will add the cradle to cradle to that as well, of course, yeah. in this episode description, but also I will add to link to your uh, documentary uh, recommendation. And I hope that the listeners will be able to get this perspective on why should we care about the planetary yeah. boundaries. Kasper, thank you very much for sharing all your knowledge and the, and the experience that you gathered over the, the years. And I wish you luck on your journey with the home.earth. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the newest episode of Earthcast. And I hope that it was inspiring for you to hear about the home.earth and how they approach building and real estate development and how they approach uh, real estate with a triple bottom line, focusing equally on people, planet and profit. If you would like to get to know something more about the circular design and home Earth's approach, feel free to contact either Casper or visit the website home.earth. If you would like to get to know something more about Herbcast, please also feel free to visit the website herbcast.pl slash en for English. And you can also follow me on Facebook Instagram or LinkedIn. Thank you for contributing, listening and talk to you very soon.